Fabulous. Okay, I'm going to start. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, you really beautifully framed how structural racism affects periphery education. Mm. I am going to, I had a hard think about what I wanted to put into this presentation. I very much am aware that discussions about racism in maternity services and midwifery education, it's a very emotive, very explosive topic. Mm. And I very much wanted this, my presentation to be somewhat solution focused. So let us move on. So I, I want to present um, things, solutions, activities, actions that you can take as an individual, as a lecturer, as a group, things that you can do to address the structural racism within maternity services and its impact upon the women that we care for. So I'm going to discuss what you can do as a student using social media, um, through writing articles, holding conferences, doing online training. And I'm also going to suggest and recommend some social media accounts for you to follow. So this is me. I am a student midwife. I'm a third year student midwife based in London. That's just, that's who I am. I'm very, very proud to be a student midwife. I wear that badge with honor. I'm also the editor in chief of the Student Midwife Journal. So me as a single student, I use my position as the editor in chief to affect change. So as you can see here, we have the October issue of the Student Midwife. It's entitled We Rise. Um, it's open access. So you can access this issue anywhere in the world without subscribing. And it was very important that we did this because this issue is completely authored by black and brown authors. And in this issue, we cover topics such as female genital cutting or female genital mutilation. I make the argument in this article that midwives and student midwives need to receive culturally sensitive education about female genital cutting in order to improve the health outcomes and pregnancy outcomes of um, female genital cutting survivors. There's also an article written by a white presenting student. She's actually um, British and Arab. Um, she writes about her experiences of white privilege and how they affect interactions within the maternity setting. We have a fabulous article by a student named Natalie Goodyear from King's. She has come up with an anti-racism pledge for midwives and student midwives. There's an article about that in there. This, uh, this issue is open access you can access it wherever you want to in the world. As a student midwife, as a midwife, as anyone interested in maternity services, I implore you to please take a look. It's not easy, it's not comfortable to examine racism as it applies to education and maternity services, but it's time. So that's just one example of what you can do as a student, literally read this issue. If you ever want to submit anything to the student midwife, that's my email. I get back to you as soon as I can, I promise. I'm very busy at the moment, but I do make my, I make um, a valid and valent attempt. Okay, what else can you do? So during lockdown, I was opted out of clinical practice. Um, this was around the time that George Floyd was murdered and I'm black. I'm quite visibly, unambiguously black. I'm aware of racism. I know it exists. I know it exists in every single country in all different guises. But the murder of George Floyd, um, I couldn't watch the video. I couldn't watch him die. I couldn't watch him be murdered. It was awful. It was extremely harrowing. And I was numb for a good few days. But um, actually, it also acted as a catalyst for me to use my social media platform to advocate for cultural sensitivity in midwifery practice and midwifery education. So I have a background in pediatric nursing and I'm familiar with the term Mongolian blue spot. Um, but following um, Mr. Floyd's murder, I began to examine the language that we use in practice, the language that we are taught at university, I began to examine society as a whole and starting with what I knew, what I'm familiar with, which is um, looking after sick children and babies and now looking after healthy and unwell women in pregnancy and following childbirth. So I began to look at the language that I've been taught 
And I started with Mongolian blue spots and I started to, I really started to ponder where does this, where did this terminology come from? Because I know that this birthmark can present in children that are not of um, Asian heritage. So I looked into the origins of who coined the term. I very much suggest that you do the same. And I also began to wonder why, if this, if anything, this term, the, the term Mongolian blue spot is inaccurate because it presents in children of all types of ethnicities. It's not, it's not just exclusive to children of Mongolian heritage. So firstly, it's inaccurate. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it's racially insensitive. Please do look that up. And there are multiple alternatives. You can call it a blue-gray nevus, a slate-gray nevus, a congenital dermal melanocytosis. There are so many terms, alternatives to Mongolian blue spot that we really don't have an excuse to keep using this racialized and outdated and inaccurate terminology. And after this social media post that I made on Instagram, I received quite a few DMs to direct mes messages from not just student midwives or midwives, osteopaths, podiatrists, pediatric nurses, and a number of them wrote to the NHS website, which is where I found this image. It says blue gray spots. This is what they have changed it to, but originally this was termed Mongolian blue spot. And I believe that if you look at the NHS website, I think for Wales, it still says Mongolian blue spot. Don't quote me on that, but please do have a look. You have power as an individual, you have power if you use social media in the right way and as a to be as a positive influence you can affect change i made this post uh, a lot of people swarm together to contact um the nhs um the curators and the organizers of the nhs website and it was changed what else can we do just think about that so i made this post in june by july it was changed Okay, so just moving on. What else can you do to affect change? So following um, that Instagram post that went viral, um, I was invited by a very esteemed nursing professor to write an article, to co-author an article about systemic racism in nursing and midwifery. So this team is made up of students and academics from the UK, the US and Australia. I was very, very intimidated. I ummed and awed for a very long time because yes, I've been published before, but not about this topic and not in the company of such esteemed colleagues. I was frightened and I buried my head in the sand for a few good weeks, but that's not me. I don't run away. I don't run away. I might hide for a little bit, but then I face whatever it is that is frightening me. So we came together and um, collaborated to create this piece um, about dismantling structural racism in midwifery and nursing education, because in light of COVID, as Sarah has beautifully explained that COVID-19 affected um, uh, people from marginalized ethnic backgrounds the worst, in light of George Floyd's murder and the uprising of the Black Lives Matter movement, in light of it being the 2020 the year of the nurse and the midwife it was past time for a piece like this to be written this piece is also um, open access we couldn't write something like this and then just lock it away it has to be open access mm -hmm. so you can access it you can access it freely i'm going to attempt to read this quote there are many many quotable sections of this article but i just picked this just this one nurses midwives and the academy can no longer be complicit in the silences around structural, individual and ideological racism. Silence is not neutral. Karen and Katz's uncompromising challenge to doctors applies equally to nurses and midwives when they write that our silence speaks volumes. It is saying that the death of an innocent black man at the hands of a brutal white police officer is still not enough for you to put your own skin in the game. Now, if we substitute the murder of George Floyd for the Embrace report, which quite clearly states that black, mixed ethnicity and Asian women have poorer pregnancy outcomes than their white counterparts, what does that, what does that mean for nursing and midwifery? 
it means that it's time to act. It means that stepping, um, staying silent, letting things happen, letting comments, racially insensitive, racially aggressive microaggressions, letting that slide, pretending we don't hear it for an easier life, it's not enough. Last night, I listened to an Instagram live between Mars Lord and Ilian Morrison. So Mars Lord is a doula, an award-winning doula, and Ilian is a registered midwife. So um, they were discussing the topic of racism within maternity services, and Ilian made the point that, so it's, it's a common question. Okay, I hear racism, I hear racial language, I see, I see um, inappropriate conduct, misconduct that has um, racist undertones or overtones, what do I do? And her, her response is quite simple. Say something. Say something. If you see something, say something. It doesn't just apply to... It doesn't just apply... Now this. I'm just going to be honest with you. If you're a white student and you overhear or witness a black student being racially abused, say something. If you're a black student or a brown student and you witness a black or brown student being racially abused, say something. It's not easy, but it's the right thing to do. I've been guilty myself of overhearing a lecturer saying to a student, I can't understand your accent. Or someone has told me that they've received feedback on an essay that I can tell English isn't your first language. And I've consoled the person, but I didn't say anything to anybody that could affect any change. So I've been guilty of that myself. But I'm here in front of you today to say that it's not enough. It wasn't enough then, it's not enough now. Going forward, it's not going to be enough. If you see it, say something. So basically, back to this article, the crux of this article is basically stating that nursing and midwifery we aren't doing enough to tackle the um, maternal inequalities that have been going on for years. They predate the 2018 and 2019 Embrace reports. Um, in the conference on Monday, um, the Beyond the Bump conference held by Cardiff Midwifery Society, Elsie Gale made the point that um, reports and statistics relating to poor maternal outcomes for black women have dated as far back as 2001. It's time to do something. So what you can do as an individual, as a writing group, you can write about what is happening and you can propose changes. So what this article did is we stated that what's happening isn't good enough and we are now writing a follow-up piece to examine what has been done since we published this article. So please do look out for that. And as you can see at the bottom here, I have included all of my wonderful co-authors. These people are all on Twitter, I think apart from Linda, but the rest of them are all on Twitter. Please do follow them. Fantastic content, fantastic content creators. Okay, thank you. I have two minutes left, so I'm just going to whisk through the West. What else can you do? As a university, as a midwifery society, you can host a conference such as the Beyond the Bump conference held by Cardiff University Midwifery Society just on Monday. It was fabulous and it was sponsored by RCM Wales. You can do this. This was a group of, I think, six um, student midwives. They put this together. They invited the speakers. They ensured the speakers were paid. They paid the black and brown people that were speakers at that conference. They paid them for their emotional labor. I was an emotional wreck after that conference, listening all day to all the terrible things that happened to people that look like me because of the way that they look. It's emotionally draining. It's emotionally draining. So the very least that you could do when you do ask these speakers to attend your conferences is pay them. It's the very, very least you could do. Beanish was fantastic. So was Mars and so were five times more. So. Again, something you could do is host a conference. Okay, I am editor-in-chief of the student midwife. The student midwife and the practicing midwife are owned by All for Maternity, which is owned by Sheena Byram and Anna Byram. So All for Maternity, we're in the process of curating and um, producing some anti-racism e-learning, which will be finished and ready for you to access in spring 2020. So we're right in the middle of curating this right now. So that's another thing you can do. You can seek out online um, 
because of COVID. Online virtual um, education, such as e-learning um, courses, workshops, masterclasses. I have provided some such resources in the reference in the resources that Sue will provide afterwards. Please do take a screenshot of all of these wonderful people's um, social media accounts. I made the point on Monday that if your social media is just they're just carbon copies of who you are as a person, what are you going to learn? So follow these people and learn about the work that they're doing in maternity services and beyond to combat structural racism. And that is me. Thank you very, very much. Thanks for watching this video from the Maternity and Midwifery Forum. For more expert opinion and analysis, hit the button below to subscribe.